Hello everyone, we're wrapping up this section with confidence intervals for the variance and standard deviation of a normal population. We have talked to great length about confidence intervals for the mean mu. Uh, we've talked a little bit about confidence intervals for the population proportion. And the third parameter we're going to see is population interval, uh, 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 confidence intervals for the variance or standard deviation. Now, uh, be aware that uh, we are keeping the assumptions made in the previous section in that particularly we are assuming that the data came from a normal distribution. In fact, it's even more crucial in this situation that we assume that our data came from a normal distribution. Um, uh, these procedures are not robust to, uh, are, are not robust to normality assumption. And in fact, if our data is not normally distributed, we may not even consider the standard deviation a good measure of the spread of the data, even if our, uh, especially if the case that the underlying data set itself is not a symmetric is not a symmetric distribution, because then it's just kind of this weird measure that uh, tends to underestimate how uh, large an observation is if it's above the mean and how how small it is if it's below the mean, stuff like that. It's kind of this weird. It's kind of in this weird place, but it should work just fine if your data is coming from a normal distribution. There is a sense, I would say, uh, what, what, what are this, what, okay, hmm, yeah, um, I actually should probably investigate myself, because I'm curious how well, uh, how, what the behavior of this interval is. If we were to increase our sample size, I think it would be okay um, because I know um, kind of the asymptotics of what's going on. Uh, but basically, you should be safe if your data is normally distributed. If your data is not normally distributed, I would think that if the samples, if the sample size is large, it should be okay too because you'll have the central limit theorem coming to your coming to your rescue. Uh, but I'm not really sure off the top of my head, so I'll have to look into that just at least to satisfy my own curiosity. Anyway, we have the following theorem. Suppose that the sample mean, so suppose that x bar is the sample mean of n iid normal random variables, s squared is the sample variance, the random variable n minus 1 times s squared divided by sigma squared, which is equal to 1 over sigma squared times the sum from i equals 1 to n xi minus x bar uh, squared, this is going to follow a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 deg uh, degrees of freedom. So the chi-square distribution actually also has uh, a degrees of freedom parameter. In fact, uh, for the t-distribution, the, the degrees of freedom parameter it's referring to is actually the d degrees of freedom of the chi-square distribution. Uh, so uh, the chi-square distribution we've talked about a little bit in uh, chapter 4 section four yes um uh, we talked about it there uh saying that it was a particular instance of a gamma distribution but really how the chi-square like back then i said it's not all that interesting when you're trying to model real world phenomena but it's very interesting as a as a statistical distribution as a sampling distribution because a lot of statistics start to resemble chi-square random variables uh, and and thus it's showing up very frequently there so uh, let's say that x is following a chi-square distribution with parameter nu then chi-squared alpha nu satisfies the following the probability that x is greater than or equal to uh, chi-squared alpha nu let's actually subset x by nu uh, is going to be greater than or equal to alpha. No, 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 not greater than or equal to. Exactly equal to. My apologies. So this should equal alpha. All right. Or if you like pictures, and I and I happen to like pictures, uh, we have a chi-square distribution. Oops. Uh, a chi-square distribution with new degrees of freedom. And uh, we have chi squared alpha nu. Uh, and the upper tail area is going to be alpha. That's kind of what the situation that's going on. 
All right, so if we want to get a, if we want to use this theorem to get a confidence interval for sigma squared, we're going to work with this statement. We're going to say that the probability that uh, chi squared uh, one minus alpha over two uh, uh, n minus one. This is less than or equal to n minus one times s squared over sigma squared uh, and this then is less than or equal to uh, chi squared alpha over 2 uh, n minus 1 okay let's uh let's play around with this uh, statement uh, the interior here let's 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 play with the interior of this we could then uh, raise everything to the basically reciprocate everything which is raise everything to the negative one power inequalities will switch direction and this statement is effectively equivalent to saying that uh, chi squared uh, alpha over to uh, n minus one uh, one to the power negative one uh, is less than or equal to uh, sigma squared over um, n minus 1 s squared uh, which is less than or equal to uh, chi squared uh, 1 minus alpha over 2 uh, n minus 1 uh, to the negative first power and this is going to be equivalent after we multiply everything by n minus 1 to the statement that um, uh, n minus 1 s squared over uh, chi squared alpha over 2 n minus 1 uh, is less than or equal to sigma squared, which is less than or equal to n minus 1 s squared over chi squared uh, 1 minus alpha over 2 n minus 1. All right. So uh, that means, and this probability was equal to one minus alpha, and therefore this is basically going to be our confidence interval. This is going to tell us what our confidence interval is for sigma squared. Uh, the, the confidence interval is going to be n minus one uh, little s squared now, because we're not talking about a random variable anymore. Uh, and then we've got chi squared uh, alpha over 2 n minus 1. This is the lower bound. And the upper bound is n minus 1 s squared over uh, chi squared 1 minus alpha over 2 n minus 1. So we have the uh, lower bound and the upper bound and notice this interval is not an equal tail interval it is not uh, estimate plus or minus margin of error uh sigma squared is not going to be exactly in the middle of this interval so be aware of that this interval is the first one we've seen that violates that notion that confidence intervals are estimate plus or minus margin of error. Okay. Um, so if we wanted to get a CI for Sigma, we can do so by taking the square root of the lower and upper bound. Since we have a what we have now is an interval for Sigma squared. So then just take the square root and then you have an, a confidence interval for Sigma. Uh, you can get one sided intervals by using either the upper or lower bound exclusively and replacing alpha over two with alpha. Okay, so uh, we have the following return from the previous 10 days, 10 days of the stock with ticker symbol CGM. Based on the plot below, the return seems to follow a normal distribution. Uh, the standard deviation and variance of the stock daily returns are given below. Uh, construct a 90% confidence interval for the true sigma of the stock's return. Uh, in finance, sigma matters a great deal since sigma is referred to as the volatility of the assets price and in finance the volatility of asset prices is of great interest so 
in this situation, the sample uh, the uh, sample size is n, which is equal to 10, which means our degrees of freedom is equal to 9, which is n minus 1. All right. Uh, so uh, alpha in this situation, since we won a 90% confidence interval, we're going to say that alpha is equal to 0.1. Uh, which is going to imply, notice that we now have basically two critical values. We don't have one anymore. Uh, so we have chi squared, one minus alpha uh, over two, um, n minus one. This is going to equal chi squared 0.959, uh, which is equal to 3.325. Uh, chi squared uh, alpha over 2 n minus 1 uh, that's equal to uh, chi squared 0.05 uh, 9 and this is equal to um, 16.919 so uh, what that means is your interval is going to be uh, uh, 9 times uh, 0.015 divided by 16.919. That's your lower bound, and your upper bound is 9 times 0.015 divided by 3.325. All right, which is going to be um, the interval uh, uh, 0 0.00798 and uh, upper bound of 0 0.0406. Now we want that's a confidence interval for sigma squared. All right, so this is a confidence interval uh, for sigma squared. If you want a CI for sigma, we're going to have to take the square root of everything. Uh, that's going to be then the square root of 0 0.00798 and square root of 0 0.0406, uh, which is equal to 0 0.089, uh, 0 0.2. Oh, one. So let's suppose for a second that you were a financial expert who cared a great deal about stocks and uh, financial assets. Uh, volatility is seen basically as a bad thing, although I don't really like calling it a bad thing. Because in finance, um, uh, you might prefer high volatility stocks because basically volatility should be rewarded. So I don't necessarily would, I wouldn't think of volatility in finance as being a bad thing more as it's something that a stock price or a, a financial asset should be compensated uh, with a higher return if it has higher volatility. So that means that uh, financial professionals would care a great deal about the volatility of a financial return and maybe uh, it depends uh, uh, of a financial asset and they might say uh, we're looking for high volatility assets because those assets should be uh, giving better returns or at least they should be. That doesn't mean they do, but um, they should be giving better returns and we, we're looking at some long term investment, in which case we don't care about short term volatility. So we're willing to buy those high volatility assets so that we can have. Uh, a better returning stock. This would probably be something where you're 25 years old and uh, you want high volatility assets because you're going to be buying these assets and holding them for 60 years. Okay, maybe not 60. Uh, 40 years, and then after you've held them for 40 years, if they, you know, that's when you're actually going to worry about whether you have the money or not and how much money you actually made. Whereas any short-term fluctuations are of no particular interest to you. Whereas if you do care about short-term fluctuations because you're planning on uh, needing this money in say five years then you probably would want low volatility stocks um, which are not going to return as well but they're also more secure so i just wanted to say that um 
you could probably guess that uh, when I when I got my undergraduate degree, I double majored in math and economics. So um, uh, anyway, here's some R code that's doing this. The functions responsible for working in the, with the chi-square distribution are the chisq class of functions. So q chi-squared is what you're going to use to get those uh, critical values. And otherwise, it's pretty much uh, standard R stuff. By this time, I really hope, by this time in the course, if you've been following with the R lab videos that you're able to understand this, right? I said at the very beginning of the course, um, uh, you may not necessarily understand the code. By now you should. And maybe even in fact, go back and review some of those uh, uh, previous code snippets that you didn't understand before and see if they work. And, and, and well, not if they work, but see if you understand them now. All right, that's it for statistical intervals. Uh, and, uh, the next topic in this class is going to be hypothesis testing, uh, single sample hypothesis testing. All right. So, uh, I will see you then and have a good day.